I'll just say a couple words, and then we'll go from there. All right. Welcome. No, oh, you're fine. You're fine. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, today is August 11th, and today we're doing intermediate camera class. Uh, it's probably everyone's favorite class of the month. Um, we go through all of the next steps to get away from auto with your camera and then move into the more advanced setting. So we'll start up in a couple minutes here. Um, but as always, I've got my online viewers here and then I have my people in the class. Today we got a small class, only one person today. Uh, I think that the weather in Illinois is just too nice to be inside. So if you're not staying live or not with me live, hopefully you're catching this on a different day. Um, but as always, if you have questions, you may say something in the chat. I can see everything there. And at the end of the presentation, my email and my phone number are now on all the presentations. So uh, if you have any questions on any of that stuff, you can call or email in. But we'll do another couple minutes here, and then we'll get started. So I'll switch over to the where I'm in the right corner, and uh, we'll get ready in a couple minutes here, guys. Thanks for anybody who's watching. No, I was going to say sorry that I'm the only, only, only one in class. <laughs> You're fine. I appreciate you showing. Because it would just been me talking in front of the camera, and then I have no feedback whether or not I'm yeah. going too fast, too slow. I told my husband to actually just like do the screen, and he's like, no, go on fast, so he asks questions, and I'm like, okay. <laughs> it's nice, especially yeah, if you're in person, then you at least get that ability. I, I, I do get people who sometimes say stuff on the chat, but I rarely get too many questions. I had a, a person who actually watched this got my information from the front desk or from customer service and called me on a different day and was like, I had questions about what you were talking about, I just didn't want to chat. I was like, oh, yeah, go ahead and ask me now, that's perfect. So I thought putting my phone number and email at the end would probably be a little sure. easier. We got a couple people on here and it's already 532 so we'll just jump right into it so welcome everybody who showed up thank you for coming uh, intermediate camera knowledge today so we'll just jump right into it you're graduating from point-and-shoot or let's say that you're graduating from your cell phone you moved into the camera world you came in last week we talked about auto We talked about shooting through the photo Comp uh, composition and then some file media formats for saving photos, what storage methods you should use, all stuff that's important for uh, someone who's just starting out who wants to take a photo, show their friends, their family, this beautiful work that they just did or the family or the vacation that they just took and have a really nice photo to show. Now we're going to start getting into the more advanced or intermediate knowledge. Um, we're going to talk about the exposure triangle in depth, which is the shutter speed, your ISO, your f-stop, and then uh, your, oh, there's one more now, I'm forgetting, shutter speed, f-stop, ISO, no, those are the three main ones. Um, so we'll be talking about all of those. We'll be talking about the trinity of lenses, so the lenses that are the most recommended. Are you traveling or are you a professional photographer and, and what kind of things you should have with that. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit more about editing software today, I believe. So let's jump right into it. Move over to this guy. There we go. So why go advanced point and shoot DSLR or mirrorless camera? Something that we kind of talked about the last time. As a photographer, if you're moving away from your physical phone, you're moving into now a more advanced camera. Your phone is a really great camera, uh, shoots anywhere between 12 and 16 megapixels, which is a pretty good number for most cameras nowadays. Um, the example I use is when I first bought my Rebel camera, my Canon Rebel back in 2011, one of the earlier models. Um, it had a 16 megapixel sensor on it and when you look at the cameras today most of them that are being manufactured start at 20 some start at 24 and then really advanced ones go all the way up to 42 64 so cameras have continuously become more and more uh, sharp more and more powerful and just better at taking quality images so going from your phone to a more advanced point-and-shoot DSLR mirrorless 
you're adding number one a really amazing tool to your repertoire of tools that you might use for art making or for uh, photography but secondly you're opening the door for something that can be more customizable something that can shoot with more intention and then something that takes just a highly detailed photo um, and that has more information for the viewer or anybody to read. So I like to start off with snapshots first for photographs. Uh, and the difference will be pretty clear with the photos here. I would consider this picture of our escalators moving up to our mattress section here in the store as a snapshot. And I would consider its companion photo a photograph. And the reason I say that is because the amount of time and composition and then as well to color coordination that went into a photograph versus a snapshot. I look at a snapshot as a way of taking a quick reference photo or a quick photo. Maybe this is a way for you to just tell your friends that, um, very much like a Snapchat, if you're familiar with that app, where you're not necessarily communicating via text. You're taking a picture of something and you're showing somebody something so they have reference of what you're speaking of. When you're taking a photograph, you're taking time and you're putting effort into this. So as you can see with this, the person who was taking the photo, they went through, they made sure they set their f-stop, they set their shutter speed, and they changed their ISO to be particular so that they could get this vignette around the photo. You can see the smoky blackness that kind of comes around the image. The color and the blue and the skyline on the top there is very bright and vivid. It's not something that you'd get standard on a phone or if you just pointed your camera with auto. This is something that you're setting within the physical f-stop to bring out that color and coordination. As well, too, um, you could see that there was a certain level of editing in post where they changed the color, they changed the saturation. So you go from this kind of boring taupe color of a wall to this almost purple color that's coming off the wall, this red-purple. Um, so again, a snapshot versus a photograph, there's more intention, there's more thought put into a photograph versus a snapshot. So step one, very similar to our basic beginners class, but going into intermediate, learn your camera. That's first and foremost. Um, I doubled up on the Sony ones to keep the pictures even. I just did that for myself. but. You can see that there are a slew of different cameras going from the Sony models. There's uh, 12 different models at the current moment, and I know that there's more coming all the time. And then you move over to Canon or Nikon, and there's easily 10 or 12 different cameras for each of those brands too. So first thing is always first, know which camera you're getting. Research the camera before you purchase it. Make sure it fits all the needs that you're looking for. If you don't need a DSLR or a mirrorless and a point and shoot works for you, go with a point and shoot. If you're within a budget, I would say look into what cameras have the best features or have what you need the most within the budget. If you're just buying a camera to get a camera and you only have X amount of dollars to spend, I might say wait and get the camera that fits your needs the most regardless of price range because that's the most important thing but always learn your camera before doing anything else. Moving into the next thing, JPEG or RAW, this is something I like to talk about because there's a big difference when we start getting more advanced with our camera. Standard JPEG is what you're gonna see as a file format on most computers. If I were to plug my SD card, I'm shooting on JPEG almost 80% of the time. Um, it's the standard picture, that quality, that shows up when you send them to friends, if you're texting photos, um, emails, if you're airdropping or dropboxing, what, what have you. Uh, JPEG is a pretty standard file format. Um, going into the one to the left of it, the RAW format, there's more information that comes with the RAW. So with the JPEG photo, the image gets processed out via the camera, via the format. And the image that you get is the image you get. It's a little more saturated, it has color, it has good depth of field. Uh, you can differentiate colors, you can see shine, shadow, it's a good photo. RAW washes everything out and gives you a pretty baseline photo. It doesn't necessarily compress any of the information, it keeps all the information open so that you as the artist can go through and actually process and play with the raw file. Uh, and an example of that is all the way to the right we have a processed raw photo. So you can see the processed raw versus the JPEG. There's more detail in the processed raw. We see the wrinkles of the shirt a little bit better. 
The color on the shirt is a little less exposed. You can see the darkness of it, but then you can also see the light parts of the dark. Um, his forehead has less of a shine. You see more detail on his forehead. And I like to point out the arm that's uh, up playing the strings on the bass. You're going to see more of the strings and more of his arm going uh, a little bit more detail within there. How are we doing, sir? How are you doing? I'm doing good. Welcome in. Yeah. Have a seat. So, is our class? This, this is our class, class, yes. Maybe I should sit on this side. By either way, whichever way you'd like to sit. Yeah, you know, teacher, student. It all works. <laughs> I didn't miss much. No, we just started. We only got about three slides into it. Um, we have another student joining. So, just so you know, I teach both on the computer and then in person, too. So, I'm going to be talking to both. Okay. Any questions you got, just mention them in here and then I'll answer them. The chat's open for people to respond to, but... Uh, intermediate class today, so we talk more about using the exposure triangle, so how to set ISO, f-stop, aperture. Yeah. We talk about the trinity of lenses, different lenses that you should have for what purposes. Okay. Uh, right now we're just going into JPEG or RAW, so what I explained basically is a shorthand version. JPEG is the standard file format that a photo will save under when you have it on your camera. Right. In your camera settings, you're able to dictate whether you want a JPEG or RAW, a, or a JPEG and a RAW file. Okay. If you just get a JPEG file, you'll notice the color and everything is compressed on there and it's already set for you. So you get a clean image, you can send that to your friends, do whatever you want. The RAW photo comes out a little more washed out. And the reason it does that is because it doesn't compress all the information from the photo and it allows the photo taker to then go in via like an Adobe Photoshop, or if you're using a Mac, you can use their photo editor. If you're using Windows, they also have a photo video editor. And you can actually change the color saturation, the hue, the levels, the exposure, and you can process that raw. And that's what we have an example of all the way to the right. Um, you can see that there's some color variation between the JPEG and the processed raw. And there's definitely more color variation from the regular raw to the processed. So. You have the option as the two. If you're someone who doesn't want to fuss over the photo, your final product looks good to you, that's all you care about, JPEG is great. So in terms of processing the raw, can you do it in the camera you have to do it like Outside of the camera. Photoshop, Photoshop, yeah, okay. exactly. Or whatever program, so if you already have a MacBook or a, a Windows computer, they already have a free editing software right. in there right when you plug in. But then you can edit the raw. You don't have to edit the raw, but the raw gives you more ability to edit it so you can change and play with that. So. Right. Um, if you're someone who likes to fiddle and, and, and go over all the tedious details of your photo, it's great to do raw. If you're someone who just wants the image as is, maybe you want to crop it, change slight colors, JPEG is the way to go. Okay. Moving from there, editing software. So I just mentioned that there's the different ones that you can use. Photoshop would be one of my favorites. Um, Photoshop you can get on the Creative Cloud. Adobe Creative Cloud is one of my favorites. Um, with the Creative Cloud, you pay monthly for it like most of the other editing softwares. But what's cool is that with the uh, Creative Cloud, it also lets you save photos to it, much like a Google Drive or Amazon Photos. Um, and you get the editing software, so that's a cool one. Underneath that, that is the Windows format for a uh, editing software. So when you're able to pull up, you'll see all of you'll see that, and it's representative of the different layers that can go into photo editing and whatnot. Um, if you're editing a photo, you can add layers to it where, let's say maybe you take something off of one layer, you can keep it on the other, you've got a bunch of different stuff to play with. And then Vinci is what I have all the way to the right. And Vinci Solutions um, is another one where it's a little bit more of a video editor, but they do have photo editing software on there too from what I understand. You pay monthly for it, but they have really nice um, color correcting and all different stuff that you can use on there. So. If you are someone that enjoys shooting on the RAW and you want to process that RAW, maybe you don't want to use something as basic as the Apple or the Mac uh, or the um, Mac ones or the um, uh, Windows ones. You can pay for any of these other solutions, which give you a little more advancement. Now, getting back into the camera, we'll talk about the mode dial. We spoke about it last week when we talked in the uh, beginners class, but a, a good breakdown for it today. We have a few different buttons on there. We have automatic. The automatic button is going to be represented either with a, uh, it's usually going to be labeled auto. It'll have a green square or it'll have a green camera plus the auto underneath it. Auto is the most basic. It does all the work for you. You don't have to do anything with it. 
you're going to see a program auto. That's going to be your P button. Um, it's going to be P on almost every camera. I've sometimes seen it as PR on some older models. But program auto basically means that you can set everything you want on there. The settings that you put on there will stay that way until you change them again. So maybe when you're shooting in the auto, you want ISO to always be at 800 because you want a little bit of grain to your photos to make it look more vintage or like film. You can set that under the program auto, and then every time you go back to it, it'll do all of the things that you want it to do. It'll color, it'll uh, choose the correct f-stop, choose the correct aperture, um, uh, uh, autofocus for you, do all that but then the ISO will stay at 800 or vice versa. Maybe you want to have control over one of them and you don't want to um, fiddle with the rest. You can do that under program auto. Aperture priority means that you're just controlling the aperture on the camera. And we'll talk about what aperture, shutter, ISO, all that is soon. Um, but aperture priority is usually des uh, described with A or AV on the camera. And that's going to allow you to just control the aperture of the camera. You're not controlling anything else. Shutter priority, same idea. You're going to see that on the camera as an S or TV. I don't know why TV was chosen, um, but S and TV are the two that you'll see on there for the most part. Uh, again, controls only the shutter when you're using the camera. And then the full manual. Just as described there, it's the M on the camera when you're looking at your mode dial. That is where you control every little bit of the camera as you're using it. Anything can be set, anything can be controlled, and we're going to learn how to fully use that today too. Everything else that you see on the mode dial is basically another form of auto for the most part. There might be some other features on there depending on what camera you have. Um, Nikon and Sony, or Nikon and Canon have two different ways that they do it. Um, Sony has another one on there. I believe it is auto, what was the Sony one? Yes. And that basically is just going to be a fancier version of an auto automatic one. Um, we can see that within Nikon's and Sony, or Nikon and Canon. Uh, Nikon has what they call scenes on the camera. I believe you have that. And scenes is just going to be their more advanced version of auto. It has a little more color in there, has a little more depth of field, does a little more work than the standard auto does. When you look at Canon, you're going to see multiple objects on the dial. You'll see a head logo, you'll see a uh, what looks like mountains with a, a cloud in the background, you'll see a flower, and you'll see a figure running. You'll also see a couple other ones on there too, and again, those can vary. But those are all different modes and scenes that are specifically in the auto category that give um, the photographer more control for certain things. So like the head would be more of a portrait, the uh, clouds with the mountain would be more of your scenery or your wide angle photography, the flower is your close up, your more detailed, and then the runner is supposed to be your action photography. That's where the shutter speed is gonna be faster. Okay, so this camera is a mirrorless camera, so it's yes. and so it doesn't have that anymore. Yes. But the DSLR that I have has, a has all that on there. But this is now you and to you too. Yeah, so, so maybe I guess I need to fix those and make them up. Well, the U2 and the U are those are going to be customizable ones. Okay. Those are ones that you can program as well. That's another one that Nikon has on there. Okay. Did do you have scene on there? Does it say? No, there's no scene. Let me see, real fast. I'm familiar with that. That's what I'm trying to tell you. No, no, no it's, yeah. it's made it a little different. It's a little different, but still very similar. So these mm -hmm. are your customizable ones. Right. You have your program auto, so right. you can set whatever you want these to be under basically okay. manual. Okay. So every time you go back to those settings, those will still be programmed for you. Right. Manual is going to be the one that you can play with the whole time. Right. Uh, aperture priority, shutter priority, right, right. programmable one and auto. Okay. So you have a similar dial to what maybe would be on the left minus a couple symbols. Okay. Um, but basically you don't need all the rest of them. Gotcha. That's, what, That's what I figured that. Yeah. You know? But I did use, I used them. Exactly. <laughs> the more advanced the camera is, especially the new Z series from Nikon, which is what we were just talking about, yeah. um, the Nikon, especially with their Z series, they eliminated a lot of their older dial modes on there because their auto automatically does that for you. The Nikon Z series specifically has an animal and a human eye tracker. Um, so jumping off topic, but if you point the Z series at a person, it'll track their eyes. If let's say you switch and there's a lizard that's walking across the way and you focus on the lizard, it'll find the lizard's eyes every time. Same thing with a dog, same thing with a cat or you know anything. 
Um, but that's a feature that's on the Nikon Z series specifically. So because of their more advanced tracking system, same thing with your Sony too. Sony has advanced tracking and everything else. So yep. So you'll see that a bunch of those are gone. Okay. <clears throat> so we talked a little bit about the aperture shutter and then manual setting, but let's finally break down what that all actually means and that's all done underneath the exposure triangle umbrella. So we'll start with the aperture and I'll break down the rest as we keep going through but aperture is going to start uh, it's going to be the iris of your camera and the easiest way to describe this is the bigger the number on your aperture setting so if you move to an auto or you move to your A or TV setting on the camera what you're going to notice, or uh, manual, sorry not auto if you move to manual or your A or TV setting, that's your aperture priority. When you're shooting, the camera is going to do all of the automatic features, but you have control over the aperture. And in the diagram that's on the screen here, you're going to see that the higher the number, the smaller the aperture, and the lower the number, the larger the aperture. The aperture is the iris or the shutter blades that are inside your camera. So if you were to look at your camera's lens real closely and you were to play with the, um, uh, the f-stop on the, on the physical lens, you might see the metal shutters in the camera move and get closer or get wider. When that happens, you're controlling the iris of the camera. So think about the iris on your own eye. Um, when you look at light directly, the iris gets smaller, and when you stop looking at the light, your eye gets more of a black area on your, phys on, on your face. And that's a very similar way that the camera works. When the aperture is at its smallest, or at its highest number, or smallest hole, um, you're able to get your foreground and your background into perfect focus. And that's a, uh, a style of shooting, and we'll see examples of it later, but it's all dependent on what you're trying to get as a photographer. You know, another similarity to that is, you know, when I go to bed at night, I take off my glasses, right? Mm -hmm. The TV is still on. When I wake up, and I swim, I see perfect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you get I'm to the I see that's I can read, yep. but then when I open my eyes up, oh, yeah. it's You're done, exactly. <laughs> And that is the worst part. Oh, that's why I hate wearing glasses. <laughs> I feel like as soon as I take these things off, I'm blind. And oh, then right. I wake up in the morning, right. I'm like, I can see. It's a miracle. See, right. <laughs> and then by the end of the day, it's, it's, it's gone. Yeah. But the aperture is a great way. And it's a great example of looking at that. With the aperture, the smaller that, or the smaller that hole is or the larger the number is on there, you're going to get the background and the foreground in, the perfect, um, in, in perfect, uh, perfect view, perfect clarity. As you start getting that number smaller and smaller, you're going to start to blur out the background and keep the foreground into attention. So the example I'll give with this one is you're with the family, you're trying to get photos in front of maybe Mount Rushmore. You would want to use an f-stop closer to 32 or 22 on there only because you'd get the background and the person in the foreground in perfect clarity or perfect, um, perfect viewing distance. If you wanted to blur out the background, you were more so focused on keeping the person in the foreground or the subject matter in the foreground in more clarity or in more detail. You'd make the number lower, opening up the iris, allowing more light to come in, allowing for the lens to focus on the foreground and start to slowly blur out the background. If we move down to the next section, we see the shutter. Shutter is going to be how fast your camera is opening and closing that iris. So that iris, as soon as you take a photo, is going to close and then it's going to open real fast. When it does that, it's going based on a shutter speed and everything basically plays within a second. So the higher the number, the faster the shutter speed. That means, so when we look at the one in one thousandths on the shutter speed list, it means that in one second, in one one thousandths of a second, our shutter is opening and closing. It's very quick. If you had a bird, or maybe a, you were at a track meet, and you have a runner in the family, or maybe you're at a hockey game, and you have someone who's moving at an incredible speed, or a bird that's moving at an incredible speed, or an animal, you might want to use a faster shutter speed to keep that object in f focus without getting blur. As we move down the shutter speed list and we get to the slower numbers, so the half a second or the one-fourth of a second, we can see that the figure starts to get blurrier and blurrier. When there's no speed involved or when there's no movement involved, we can use a lower number shutter speed to get more detail out of the photo, to get more information. If we go higher with the number, 
we're going to get a faster photo, but we're going to lose detail. That's where then the aperture and the shutter kind of get, you know, combined in, and then we throw ISO in there, which we'll talk about. But if you're just using the um, shutter priority, aperture priority, you only have to focus on one of those two things. Focusing on all of them is when you look at manual, and that's when you're physically playing with both and you're taking photos, uh, adjusting things on the camera, taking another photo. There's a lot of play and a lot of giving back that takes place with that. Um, but the best school of thought is if you have an object that's in extreme motion, a faster shutter speed is required, so a higher number. If you are in slow motion or not a lot of motion, a lower one will be better because you'll get more detail out of that. Shutter is also going to be S on the camera or it's going to be the TV. Move down from there and now we have the uh, ISO. ISO is going to be the sensitivity level that the camera has. So when you have light in an image, uh, you ne don't necessarily need to have a, a high ISO number. Having something like a 50 or a 100 will allow the camera to pick up its natural light that it sees around and not really have to overcompensate or over adjust. A higher ISO might be used if let's say you're um, at a homecoming of some sort and you're in a gymnasium, it's dark, you have some flashing lights, you might turn the ISO up higher in order to get more light out of the area and that'll help bring more information to the camera. The caveat of doing it, you can see the dots across each of those start to get bigger and bigger, is the graininess of the photos. When you play with ISO on a photo, you're allowing for more grain or more um, disturbance to happen in the photo, and I have examples of that to kind of show what I'm meaning. These are the three main things that when people play with manual, you're actually controlling. You can go ahead and play with the white balance all you want and see what the differences are there. You can change your autofocus range to see what you're actually locking into. But if you're going to use manual or you're going to use aperture priority or shutter priority, these are the three things every photographer needs to keep in mind when shooting. Talking about aperture a little bit more, here's a further, uh, another display or diagram to kind of break it down. When the number's higher, we have the background and the foreground in perfect clarity. So pyramids and our person in front of there. Subject matter is going to be the whole object. So we have the person and then we have our pyramids. They're both in full frame. We move to F16, we're going to start to notice that the pyramid starts to get a little bit more blurry. Not quite too much, but it starts to give more emphasis to the person and less to the background. And then as we keep moving down the row, 5.6 is a good example. We start to really lose the object in the background, the color starting to fade. And when we get down to 1.4, the most open that your iris can be, then we completely lose the background. We only have the subject matter. A great example for this is if, you know, if you're doing portrait photography, you might want to have an f-stop of 1.4. Typically, when you're buying lenses, too, you'll notice the more expensive the lens, the lower the f-stop. And that's a whole thing, too. Um, a lot of lenses, if it's a variable zoom lens and it moves, it might start at an f2 and then it'll go to a f6 or f5.6. That's an example of the lens not necessarily being able to stay open at the 1.4 or a, a 1.8, um, which I've seen on most lenses is the lowest number. Um, but as it changes, it needs, it'll then go to a different f-stop, and that, again, depends on the lens. Not necessarily something too important as you're a beginning photographer, but as someone who's an intermediate or an advanced photographer, if you have a client that you're taking photos for, or let's say that you have a photo shoot schedule, then you're, you're going out, you want to make sure that f-stop's pretty specific on the lens, that way you're able to open it up to whatever you need it to be. Um, but again, higher the number, the more you're able to keep the background and the foreground in perfect clarity. The lower the number, the more you push the background away and you keep the person who's in the foreground in the picture and in the most clarity. These are some good examples. So if we look at the one on the left, the dog nose, we can see that the nose of the dog is our foreground. It's the thing that we're looking at the most. The dog in the background is going to be what is kind of further away from the camera. If we look at our uh, aperture chart here, 
we're probably looking at something that's either an F8 or an F5.6, maybe an F4, but the dog in the background still has a lot of color and a lot of detail. So I don't think that the aperture is too low of a number um, because we're still able to see it. However, if we look at the picture of the squirrel, you can tell with the greenery and the brown and everything else that it's probably trees and everything else, foliage in the background, but you can't really make out what any of that stuff is. So I would say that's probably closer to an f2.8 or an f1.4 even. The squirrel's face has a lot of detail, but as we even get to the back of the squirrel, like his tail, um, we're losing that detail as well. So again, when you're starting to shoot, if you're doing an aperture priority setting on the camera, playing with where what you're taking a photo of can make or break kind of how you're or playing with it will help figure out what the best uh, f-stop is for what you're taking a photo of. Um, I don't think there's a right or wrong answer for either of these. If you wanted to keep the other dog in full detail, I don't think that would have looked bad, but it definitely would have taken less priority off the dog in the front. And vice versa, if we're taking a picture of the squirrel, we probably don't need to include the background. It's nothing important. The squirrel is the main focus on the image. So having that f-stop at a low number, at a 1.4, we're only drawing attention to the squirrel. Another good example too, we have our minifigure in full example. We probably have just a sea of like Christmas lights behind them, but because we have the f-stop at such a low number, uh, we barely can make out the background. It kind of looks like city lights or um, just light, lit up dots. So it has a nice kind of creative touch to it. So why use aperture priority mode? You know, looking at a photo like this, we're probably able to set um, especially in this one, you can make out the background, you can make her out too, you can see that the water behind her has good detail but it's slightly blurrier. Using aperture priority is something that the photographer or the artist is using because they want to dictate where your eye is going as the viewer. If you're the photographer and you're trying to take a picture of something in particular, you as the photographer have control over how your viewer or how your person is going to see it. So setting the aperture to the appropriate um, f-stop so that way you either have the background in focus or the background out of focus um, could really make or break the, uh, the photo for especially what your intention is for it. In this case, I think it was important for the photographer to get both the background and the subject matter so that way we could see that this woman is standing in front of this beautiful background. I think if the background was anything less exciting, we probably would have had a, high, a lower f-stop number to really blur that out and to draw more attention to her. So. It's important if you really want to dictate what the viewer is seeing as a photographer. And then again, to review, I like this image a lot. F-stop of 32, you've got the background in full focus and then you've got your log. You've got that ugly trash can in the background that you can see when you're taking this photo. If you were seeing that, you didn't want to see it, but you really love the coloration on that wood, you'd start changing the f-stop to get that example. So. F16, we're starting to blur that out, but we could still kind of make out that that's a blue trash can. You get to F6.3, you can see background, you can see foliage, and you can kind of make out that that's water if you really look closely. Um, but you can still make out what the background looks like on there, but you get the full detail of the tree. Once you get to that F2.8, I barely can tell what's behind this tree, and I guess with the context of the photo, I probably wouldn't be able to tell you that, that that's tree bark either. I probably wouldn't know. So that's another thing too, depending on the context of what you're taking a photo of, having the background associated in the picture could help dictate what your viewer is seeing and help your viewer put two and two together, especially if you're taking something that's more abstract. Shutter speed. So with shutter speed we're talking about how fast the actual iris or the shutter blades of the camera are closing. With the shutter speed chart up above, we're seeing that a one in five hundredths of a second is going to stop a person in motion and kind of capture that frame. If you think of a movie or TV, um, it, it goes by frames. So when you're shooting a video, it's going frame by frame. And if we broke that down, we basically would get this kind of stop and start motion of a person running. We would see one leg slowly start to go in front of the other, and we would see them start to take steps. If we think of shutter speed in the same way, Think about it as a movie is playing in front of your eyes and that you are taking a still from that movie. 
if that's the case, you're trying to take the most non-blurry, perfect still that you can. So my example is the bird that's moving its wings. I get a lot of birders who come in, they want to take a good photo of a hummingbird as it's going into a tree. How do you do that without getting all of that blur and motion from the wings of the hummingbird? You would take that shutter speed, jack that number up so it's one in a thousandth or one in five hundredths. And from there, when you're taking that image, you're going to pull an image that is going to have the bird almost in perfect motion with no blur. So you should get details of the wings, you should see details on the feathers, maybe the background depending on your f-stop, just what we were talking about before. But it's important with shutter speed that you're getting the, um, you're stopping whatever you're taking a photo in of in, um, in motion without getting blur or with blur depending on what you're trying to accomplish with that. And I have some examples to kind of get better examples. So freezing action, one in one thousandths or faster. We have a surfer on our right here. He's moving at a fast rate. The water is moving at a fast rate. If you were to keep your shutter speed super low, you would miss out on a lot of detail from the water, but you would get a, just a blurry mess of an image. Using a higher number, you're going to see some motion, you're going to see some blur. The water doesn't look perfect by any means, but you can see your surfer in perfect detail and they don't have any blur to them, they don't have a lot of movement where the water does. So this was an effective way of breaking the image down so that you didn't just get this very blurry, quick image. You took a very fast photo with the correct lighting, with the correct f-stop, and you were able to blur the background out slightly and get the person in the foreground in perfect detail. This might be a setting on the camera where you just play with your shutter speed priority for something like this. Let the camera do the rest of the work as far as the lighting, as far as the f-stop, but you as the photographer are just using the shutter so that way you're capturing this person in the proper frame that you need them in. Going back into my bird example, the wings are still a little blurry on here, so maybe it was one in thousandths. It could have been maybe one in six hundredths or one in five hundredths. But this would be a great example of a bird, especially a hummingbird. Their wings, I think, are one of the fastest moving wings of all the birds. They're extremely quick. So in order to stop that, not only do you have to have a camera that's capable of hitting a, a very fast uh, shutter speed, but you got to set your camera so that it's got the correct shutter speed. So anybody who's trying to take nature, I like to use the track meet, for example, since everybody who's in a track meet runs in a circle. Um, but anything where there's a lot of motion and you want to break that motion down and get something clear, shutter speed's going to be the answer. You see so much detail in the yellow of the bird's body and you could see a slight blur in the wings. Um, that's just something that gets practiced and played with until you as a photographer feel very comfortable with how you're setting your shutter speed. I would say if the item is in or the person or thing is in extreme motion, one in, one in one thousandths or faster is your best friend. If it's something that's moving slower, not too fast, maybe you're at the zoo and there's some animals moving quickly but not too quickly, using something slower than that would probably be more appropriate. Um, if you're taking photos in nature, you probably don't need a fast shutter speed at all. Uh, I wouldn't say uh, a half a second would be appropriate because there's still movement even if there's not that much movement, but maybe doing one in a hundredths or um, one in one fifty would be a good option too. And then creating mood with long exposures. So one of the things I like uh, on a bunch of the cameras, you're going to see a function called be on the mode dial. If you don't see it in the mode, then if you go into the um, shutter speed of the camera, you'll probably see a B button on there too. The B on the camera is going to be your bulb. And the idea was that way back in the day when you had a film camera or you had one of those even old timey ones where they would hold the light up and then take a picture of you, that bulb would be an extreme flash that would light up everything in front of you. They then changed the bulb term to be that the camera itself is going to keep its uh, shutter open for the whole time that you're holding that button or until you click it again. So an example of something that might be appropriate for that is this waterfall, for example. The person who took this photo put the camera on a tripod, they pointed the camera towards the waterfall, and they kept that bulb open. The camera then recorded and took a long exposure photo 
of everything that it saw. So from there, you can see the blurriness on the water because the water is constantly changing, it's moving in different directions, it's splashing in all these different ways. But the things that aren't moving are the greenery around it. That's why the rocks stay in perfect, um, perfect color and perfect shape. We see slight blur around a lot of the foliage and vegetation in the top left corner. And the only reason I could say that is because wind, if you're doing a long exposure and you have any kind of movement, the camera's going to pick up on that. The rocks look perfect because they're not moving, but the trees, the branches, the leaves, all that can move. So you'll see slight movement with there. Um, the other example I give is fireworks. I get a lot of parents who have their kids play with sparklers for the fire, for 4th of July, and they'll do these long exposures where the bulb will stay open, the B button will be clicked the entire time, and then the kids will sit there and they'll swing the sparklers and they get these really cool shapes and distraction lights uh, from that. Same thing with fireworks too. If you've got a really nice tripod you set up, got the fireworks going, you can literally get a photo of every single firework that goes off in that one night mm -hmm. and have little to no blur on everything else, but the fireworks will look really cool, much like how this waterfall looks, where you get a little bit of motion, but you get the meat and potatoes of the photo. Another long exposure example. Here, he set the, uh, the photo, or the camera, probably up on a bench or maybe a low tripod. The bike is not moving, he's not moving, the ceiling and the platform are not moving. That's why you don't see any blur or any motion on those. But you see the lights of the train as they zip by and you can kind of make out that that's the train but you don't see it. Another example would be like traffic lights. You see sometimes see like a cool picture of like traffic light beams that are like going through where it looks like their tail lights kind of like flew off with like cool like light patterns. It's a very similar tech, or it's the same exact technique. It's the long exposure where we can see everything as it's going past, but we can't make it out because it's been held open and there's blur, but it's done for an artistic choice. And funny enough, if you look through the train photo, you can actually see the writing of whatever business is behind the train there too. Probably as the train was going by, those little notches where you can walk in between the two trains, that's where the camera was able to pick up whatever that business name was. So. Another example of just something fun that you can do if you're playing with your aperture or with your shutter speed or with long exposure. Why use shutter priority mode? I think this photo kind of sums up why you should use it. If you're taking a photo of something and there's motion in there, nobody wants to see a blurry photo. You don't want to see a blurry photo. If you take a bunch of photos like this, I'm sure you're just going to spend your whole night deleting old photos. Um, Play with the shutter speed. This is an example of either rugby or ultimate frisbee. I have absolutely no idea which one it is because I can't see what's in his hand. If we had just a little less blur, I probably could make out what this person's doing. Um, so with this guy, I would say the biggest thing with shutter priority is making sure that whatever you're taking a photo of that's moving within a certain speed or action, you are breaking that photo down, you're breaking that image down, and you're able to get a clean, crisp still of whatever it is. Um, whatever speed you have to set it to, if they're moving in extreme motion, a higher number is used. If they're not moving in extreme motion or they're slow, a lower shutter speed can be used. But it's all up to how you as a photo photographer want to make that look. If there's an artistic choice you want with that, or if you just want the cleanest image you can take. Um, that's where you'd want to use shutter speed priority. Another good example. In this case, the background necessarily doesn't have any importance to it. It's moving lights. Um, but whatever shutter speed priority they were able to use this at, which probably would have been closer to that one in one thousands given how fast dirt bikes go, they were able to break the image down. The wheels have slight blur to them. He has a slight blur to him as he's in the air, but it's not nearly as bad as the image before. So again, that's where the make or break can happen with the shutter priority and it's important to remember what you're using. ISO. So same shutter speed and aperture for all of these photos but a different ISO. ISO is going to be the information or the light that the camera is allowing in. There's also a light exposure dial on some of the more the newer uh, mirrorless cameras. You can play with that too. ISO, if you, have a, if you have a light exposure on there, that's more so what I would be playing with as far as what you're setting your light to. Um, that should be one of the dials on the, end, on the top of the camera that you're able to turn and not turn. 
and you'll see the photo on the screen even get brighter or if you're using the LCD you should also see it in the viewfinder too it'll start to get brighter but if you're playing with ISO that will naturally help the camera develop the photo in a brighter or non-bright situation the issue with that is that it also affects the graininess of the photo so if we look at the ISO that's set to 100 the pier is almost pitch black you can't make out anything about the pier the sand is really dark, the shadows in the foreground of the water are dark, and really our only light source is coming from the back where the sunset and the horizon line are meeting. Good color, dramatic, but it might be a little bit too dark for your viewers to really make out what, what is going on. You move to 200, you can see that the sand starts to lighten up, the background becomes much more bright, you get a little bit more light coming off that sunset, the water in the foreground gives you a little more reflection and you can make out that that's water and not just some textured surface. And then as you keep going down the 400 and the 800, you're just going to get brighter and brighter. More of that stuff is going to become more apparent. But as you do that, you can see in the 800 where you start to get a really bright light that's coming out and now you're starting to wash stuff out. This photo is pretty dark by nature, so you're not really seeing too much of the washed out quality that the um, ISO can have. I have more examples for that. 800 would probably be the most appropriate for this photo because you can make out the background clearly. You get this nice dramatic bridge or pier that's going in the foreground or in the middle of the photo, and the foreground is light enough that you can see the reflection off the two. You get cool color. Um, it's a very fun photo. ISO with noise, now this was my example, photo is the same, aperture priority, everything's the same. On one side you have ISO being 100, it's letting more light in, but in this case with the Empire State Building being in the background, you are, I think that's the Chrysler, I think that's Chrysler, it's the Chrysler Building. You can see the Chrysler Building in the background, you can see the color. The skyline in the back where the, where the sun is positioned, because it's not an overly cloudy day, it's probably a sunset period of time, there's still a good amount of light that's in the picture. So the ISO really doesn't get affected by this. But by jacking that ISO up when you don't need to, you're going to get a grainy photo and you're going to see all of those dots or they call them grain. Uh, I think of it if you took sand and you dumped it on your photo and you kind of just shuffled it around, you would still see your image, but then you'd see all these tiny little granular dots. And that's what ISO looks like if it's turned up too high. So clean image has a low ISO number, noisy image has a high ISO number. Um, ISO is great to set at a higher number if you're in a dark situation. That's where you'd want to set it higher. Then you should see less grain because there's less light to cause that graininess to appear. If you're doing something where there's a good amount of light and you set that higher, that's where you'll see it. Less ISO, more light, no grain. Clear image. Still a little blurry because they probably don't have the proper lens on for this zoom photo that they're trying to take or they just don't have a high megapixel camera um, or the image itself is just not a good picture. But regardless, you see that the, how the ISO can be effective. Auto ISO, when to use it. I like to use ISO when I am, so personally for myself, I set all my photos to an 800 ISO. Um, I like when my photos have this grainy quality that almost feels like film. When you would buy old film, it would actually tell you what number ISO was already on the film. So it would say like, you're buying Kodak 400 film. That means it had 400 ISO already built in. So when you throw the film into the camera, you'd be just sitting there setting the aperture and the shutter speed, and that was it. The camera already had the ISO built into it. Digital cameras now give us the ability to play with this ISO. So when you have your digital camera, I say using auto ISO is really cool when you're going in and out of places. Let's say you're doing a homecoming shoot. Maybe you've got photos of the kids with their dates. Um, in the outdoor area and then all of a sudden you go indoors for some photos by a fireplace or something. You might want to keep auto ISO on because you're going to be going from indoor to outdoor to indoor to outdoor and so setting that constantly might become an annoyance or just become a hassle, especially if you're dealing with shutter or aperture priorities already. Um, let's say you're in one environment consistently, you're not changing, it's a bright sunny day, maybe you're going through North Dakota or South Dakota so you're seeing Mount Rushmore, you're going to the national parks, 
you might not necessarily need to set auto ISO. You can just set ISO at 100 or at 50 to keep it low because you've got nice light, you've got nice environments. You don't really need to focus on the ISO part of it. You more so need to focus on the shutter or the aperture. So I guess where I'm going with that is that with auto ISO, you can use it whenever. Um, if it's something that you really don't care about, you don't want to f uh, mess around with or fiddle with, I would say keep it on auto. But if you're someone who has a particular photo style, you either want a super clean, crisp image, the lower the number, the better. It'll always be better that way. Play with your light exposure on there instead. Um, if you're someone who wants more of a vintage feel on your photos, setting it to 800 to maybe about 1,000, that's a great place where you get graininess no matter what photo you take, but it's a, an appropriate graininess. It makes it look like a vintage camera. Um, and if you're someone who might want to switch it depending on the situation that you're in, you want to have full control over every aspect of it, you're a manual person, then switching between keeping ISO open so that you can change the number, that's probably the most appropriate thing for you. But to review again, going back through, let me move my little face on this camera so that everyone who's watching can see this. There we go. Put myself down in the corner. So f-stop going from the top we have f16 down to f1.4. In the f16 photo, our piggies are in clear detail. So is the background couch area that they're sitting on. As we move to an f1.4, that background is going to be almost completely gone. Um, it's a little tougher just because these photos are small, so it might not be the easiest thing to see in the world. But if we look at the piggies on the far right with that f1.4, the piggies are in full detail, but that background's gone. Going down, when we look at the shutter speed, the one in one thousandths, we can see the person clearly swinging the hammer. Uh, we can make that frame out perfectly. As we move down the, low, the row, the hammer starts to get more blurry. And then as we get into the real low numbers, the hand and the hammer are blurry. And then when we're at the one fourth and the one second, uh, or the half a second, that's where it's really tough to make out what we're seeing there. Everything's blurry. We just have a little bit of darkness from the hand, which stays in the one kind of generalized spot as it's swinging. Moving into ISO, we can see that the penny on the far left is perfect detail. We've got good relationship between background and the penny. Color looks nice. We start to move into the higher numbers. The background and the penny start to lose that contrast between dark and light. We're lightening up the image and by doing that we're causing more grain to, to appear. Um, so yeah, just another way to look at it, another way to understand it. But no matter what, if you're doing full manual or if you're just controlling one aspect of it, it's important to remember that this is most likely why when you first pick up a camera and you just try to shoot with it, you get an image that just doesn't look right because you're shooting on manual, you're not controlling any of these probably because you don't even know how or you've never understood what those actually mean. That's why you're taking a photo that looks less than par or um, looks like garbage, for a lack of a better term. So, you know, when you buy these cameras, you're so limited by your f-stops because this particular, I bought this camera, yeah. here, and the f-stop is four to six point three. Exactly, you're limited. You know, so, when do I get into the big deal? I got to spend money. And that's exactly. And that's where getting a kit lens, so you were asking in the beginning if there was other lenses, and we'll talk more too with the lenses, but, and that's where I get a lot of customers that ask, the f-stop really, I mean, for, for the everyday photographer, you they shouldn't... They don't give them any options. They don't. Well, at least with the base level, they don't. And that's just because the camera bodies are so expensive nowadays that if they want to give the customer something that has a good lens or a good starting point while you have a nice heavy body, they give you a cheaper lens. So that way you get the body. Exactly. I would say, though, with an f4 to f6, yeah. it's, a, it's a higher number for sure. You can't go as low as an f1.4, right. um, but you still can blur that image out pretty, or the background out pretty good, and then still have focus on the foreground. I know it's not the sharpest or the most effective, but you'll still get a pretty good... You know, where, while you were talking, I was, I was looking at what my other ones came with. This was a 3.5 to a 5.6. This was my 5200. Yep, exactly. You know, so, again, a kit. Okay. But I did buy a, a, a long range, but these now, what's the, what's the long range? Just go from, um, over here. it's hard to tell. Go 
Oh, this, this goes from 55 to 200. Okay, and what's so the f-stop on that? F-stop on this thing like it's fixed at 4.5. So it, it might be, yeah, and that's something. So to some lenses, so the more... Because it's so far, you know, you're going far, so... A lot of the times, though, if you see a kit lens, it won't have that fixed 4.5. So I would look at your kit lens, too, to see what yours came with, but it most likely is a variable. And again, if it's a higher number, it's the cheaper of the glasses that they're putting into their lenses. Okay. So there's two, there's two schools of thought. You can put the money into the better glass, the better f-stop. That's really what you're paying for, or the motors on when the inside. When you say better f-stop, you mean an f-16 or f one I mean, a, I mean a higher, yeah, I mean a lower f-stop. Lower f-stop. Oh, yeah, that's exactly. Right. Because you, that's always expensive. Right? Exactly. But the thing is, is, with these guys, you're only getting a lower f-stop. Your f-stop can still go as high as 22, 32, depending on your camera's f-stop abilities. True. So you'll be able to do the four, and then you can set it all the way up to 32. So you're saying, even though this limits me, no big deal? I don't think for, yeah. I mean, again. No, you're right about that. I've been playing with that yeah. on, the, on the camera. Yeah. And it seems to have gone further, but I'm not sure if I'm really getting that or am I still limited by this? Because I, I don't get the, the fadiness that yeah, yeah, yeah. you're showing me yeah. when I go to like F something else. 100%. It doesn't come out that way. It still limits me, I think. Yeah. I think, I think we're still in that ball. And I think it's only because he yeah, has the kid lenses with that yeah. in that so, case. I mean, the, the, I think the camera has to match the lens, you know, so we can get the full complement. And you can't get a lens that goes all the way from 1.4 to 16. They, they don't make well, it. they do, they do, but the thing is, is that you don't necessarily need that because no matter what, whatever number they're telling you on there, it yes. doesn't mean that your cam or your lens only goes f4.6 f4. to 6. Okay. It goes f4. Yes. All the way to f thirty two. What it's saying though is, as you're changing, so what size is that lens? Lens again, sixteen to fifty? Yeah, twenty four to fifty. So that basically means that, and if you open up your kit, so if you're shooting, and I can kind of show you when we're done with everything, okay. but if you're doing the live view on the LCD screen and you're not looking through the physical viewfinder on there, you're okay. looking through the screen. Yes. As you're changing that lens from the twenty four and you're moving to fifty, yeah. keep it at the base level, your f stop of uh, four. Four. And watch as you move to that 50, it's going to change its base from 4 to 6. Oh. So you're still able to go from 4 to 16, okay. or from 6 to 16, or you know 32 so or 22, whatever. depending. Yes, yes, yes. It's the base number of your f-stop that's changing based on what variable you're changing your zoom to. Okay. The same thing for yours, too. That's why it shows that number through that. It doesn't mean that you're limited to only F4 to F6. Gotcha. It means that when you're at 24, it'll be the F4. F4. And as you move to F... 50, uh, no, exactly, to 50, it's going to then start to slowly so change to F6, F6 if right. that's the lowest F-stop that you have on there. Okay. And if you see a lens that says F1.4, F2.8, that means if you take that lens out of the box, throw it on the camera, yeah. and you set the aperture on there, it should only let you go, it'll let you go all the way down to 1.4 and then let you go all the way up to 32 or 22 depending. Oh, okay. Yep. Okay, that's all. So that's what that means when you're getting a lens. So for any of the, and you're actually, I bet, let me move this back to my corner there and then let me, okay, so I guess we'll talk about the trinity of the lenses at the very end of this class, at the very end, but then I'll, I'll, I'll explain that again. Where do we get the cheat sheet? I would say take pictures of all this stuff because I don't got. I, I probably could email you, you know, this slideshow. I have a, a triangle. You ever seen? I don't think I have a piece of paper here. But the exposure tray. It's it should look just like yes, a, like pyramid. a pyramid. Yep, right. exactly. It's on my desk, but I, I use that. It is so. Going back on my slides, I know I've got a lot more viewers. So thank you for everybody who's been watching this. When I go back, so this exposure triangle kind of just puts it out on uh, it, the, the hamburger photo stops cheat card. If you want, I would take a photo of this guy. This is probably the big one that everybody loves to have. Yes, I like that. Um, there are the most famous version of this. I don't use it in mine because I think that this shows it a little bit better. But the most famous version is literally a triangle that does right. this exact same thing that right. shows like, oh, if you're well, doing you this can, and you can move that, that and right. it's they copied it out of one of those books. Or something. Yeah, and that's great because that's exactly what this is. The only difference is that it's in the triangle format versus right. this. But yeah, it'll 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 tell you the same kind of shtick. Um, ah, where was I going? So here, let's go back to exposure meter. So we were talking about the light and everything else on the camera. 
When you're looking through the viewfinder on the camera, or if you're looking at the LCD screen, you should see this at the bottom. Sony is going to look similar. I can't remember if it does notches or if it does numbers. Um, but actually, you probably could tell me when you look through it. So look through your viewfinder, uh -huh. and then do like a half pull on the trigger. Do you see that like set of like notches on the bottom of your screen at all? Yeah, it looks like they're like little dash marks. Exactly. Okay, so they're dash marks. Any numbers on there? Um, it goes from, like, I think it's negative 5 until, like, 5. Cool. Okay. So, Nikon is the only brand that doesn't do the numbers. Canon does the numbers, and then so does Sony. Those are going to be your exposure. So, as you're taking photos, you're going to see that there's this line that, if you when you half-click, it appears under part of that. When you are taking a photo on manual or on aperture or shutter priority, that's the light exposure that your camera is getting. To take a more accurate photo, the goal is to always get that line under the dead center. So either under the home plate or under the zero or whatever the dead center of it is. The line that's ticking back and forth between it, if you can get it in the dead center of the exposure meter, it's going to take the best photo, the best lighting, everything else. Automatic, or when you're using auto, it'll auto, auto do that for you. So you don't have to worry about that. But if you're now experiencing or experimenting with your aperture, your shutter, or your manual, that's where then you can play with that. Um, again, getting it closest to the middle will take the cleanest photo. Some people will have preference on where they want it to meet. I personally like mine to kind of go a little bit more towards the negative, uh, only because the light is a little less on there, and I feel like the contrast between my photos looks a little bit nicer. Especially for me, I like my photos to look like I'm taking a picture with film. I don't necessarily want the most clean image. But if you want a super sharp, super clean image, you can zoom in and see all the perfect details, get directly in the center of your exposure meter, and you'll have good color, good saturation, and then a good, clean, centered image. Full manual, we've been kind of covering that overall, but I like to explain it again. It's control over both the aperture and the shutter speed, as well as the ISO. But when you're doing aperture and shutter, you can always switch it to where it's not doing um, auto ISO. You can control that. But most people, they'll keep it on auto ISO until they're using full manual and then they have control over all three. I have some example photos before we talk about lenses. So these are all photos that were done on manual. And what I like to break down is what we're seeing in the photo and how it relates to the translation of setting things up on your exposure triangle. So when we look at this image, first off, going back into our camera basics, we're setting up composition. We have um, convecting lines that are all reaching towards a vanishing point in the center. The horizon line is basically just on the top of that bridge. So we have our perfect line that separates everything going across. All of our lines are moving towards the back corner or the back of that photo that we can see all the way, so the dot, the vanishing point. From there, we're going to see a good saturation of color between both the background and the foreground, which would lead me to believe that the f-stop is going to be a lower number, something that's probably a 2.8, a 4, something where the background, uh, or sorry, it's going to be a higher number, I should take that back, it's going to be a 22 or a 32, where the background and the foreground are in perfect detail. I might even say that it's an 18 or a 16, because if you look at those far back back buildings, you can't even make them out. Um, that could just be the camera and the sensor that it has, but that could have also been the f-stop that they were setting. Um, as far as ISO, there's a little bit of graininess in the dark uh, quadrants of the photo. So if I look at like where the bridge meets at the, the railing right there, it's probably one of my darker spots. Or if I look at the roof or the black on the windows in the far back, I can see a little bit of dots there. So the ISO definitely was a little bit higher than at 50 or 100. And that's probably also why those lights look so bright as they're coming at you from the building, rather than being a little more subdued. Um, and then if we're talking about shutter, the shutter probably is at a low number. It doesn't need to be super high. Um, I assume that it's going to be at a lower number because of the color saturation we see. The higher the shutter, usually the brighter the photo comes out. The lower the shutter, the darker the photo comes out. And when you're using something like full manual, that's where ISO and aperture become really important. Um, if you now, if they were just using a shutter priority, I think that would be a little foolish for this 
this type of image, but um, they probably the same thing. They let the camera do all the auto focus on their auto features on there, and then only focused in on the physical shutter speed. But again, for uh, a background, for a landscape image, probably not necessary. Now we've got some cherry blossoms in the foreground here. Our background is blurred out, so it leads me to believe that we have probably a middle number f-stop, so something closer to like a 16 or an 8. We can still make out the background. It's still pretty legible. That's extra branches and extra cherry blossoms. But our main subject is the foreground, is the branches that we're looking at. From there, ISO looks good. I don't really see any graininess in this photo, so that would probably make me to believe that it's a 50 to 100 ISO, maybe 200 at tops. Um, but everything looks very light, bright. We've got good dark colors in the flower buds too. When we look at the branch, there's some dark colors. We don't see a lot of dots or graininess in there. Um, and then as far as composition, um, you know, we do have the branch that's cutting through the back of this guy. So we're probably looking at more of a horizon line right there with this being the foreground and then the top being the background. But for this image, it really doesn't matter. Um, the f-stop's doing all the work for us on this one, ISO set low, and then shutter speed is probably kept at a middle range number, um, just because there is wind kind of going with this one, so we don't have to worry about motion too much, but at the same time, um, we don't need to be very fast. The fireman with another fireman in the background, f-stop's probably kept somewhere at the 1.4, probably a little higher, maybe a 4, or a 1, uh, probably at 2.8 to 4 or 6, because we can clearly make out that there's another fireman behind him. Um, and they're not overly blurry, so we can kind of see where the face and where the helmet, where all the gear basically lands on this person. They're in full detail. There's not a lot of chatter or graininess happening on the darkest parts of the photo, so the ISO's probably also kept low on this one. Compositionally, we're focused in on the eyes. Uh, I know we talked about that one. Keeping detail on the face brings out dramaticism with the photo, good coloration. So again, just remember, or this would probably be a great example of just using the aperture priority rather than doing a full manual or doing a shutter speed priority. The ram's head. This one overall, so the foreground, the physical RAM is definitely going to be in more detail. The background's slightly blurrier, but you can still make the background out as a snowy area with a tree, so really the f-stop's going to be higher, probably in the 20s. Um, the grainy, or the, um, the vividness of the fur and everything else makes me believe that this is a much longer exposure. So as far as shutter speed, it's probably going to be on a tripod of some sort, and it's going to be at a much slower closing number, just so that way you can pick up the hair and all the different follicles and the grooves and everything else. You can almost feel this photo, is what I tell people. Um, the other thing, too, is the color is really sharp on this one, so ISO is probably low as well, too. There's no reason for a high ISO on this one. Uh, the bottom fur, that's the darkest part, is really crisp and not grainy. So, um, higher f-stop number, uh, lower or slower shutter speed, and then ISO is probably kept at a pretty average number. These guys, good examples of something that's probably done on full manual. Only reason saying is, number one, you have a dog that's moving in motion, but not only is it moving in motion, it's getting airborne, twists, turns, mouth opens up, all craziness, fur is moving too. So the shutter speed is probably going to be one in one thousandths or higher for this one. I'm assuming higher. F-stop on this one's going to be a big one. This is definitely going to be a premium lens that this person is using. Probably an f1.4 on this guy. Just the detail on the dogs and the detail in the background being gone, especially in the one on the left where we see the face of the dog. I barely can make out that those are trees. I would assume this is probably a park, so those are either cars or um, picnic tables or people enjoying their day. Uh, the dog is in complete detail. You're not seeing any motion there. Even where the dog took off on the ground or where it's about to land, that grass is in perfect clear. Um, uh, focus. Yes, that's the word I was looking for, perfect focus. Moving to the right one, 
background's blurry, you still can make out that those are trees, the foreground is in good focus, and then the dog is moving, so f-stop for this one is probably a 2.8, maybe a 1.4, but the background doesn't feel blurry enough for that. I know, it's always the next move, I know, it's the next one, I know. It's one of those things that when you finally learn the difference and when you see the difference, and then once you practice with your cameras, then you really get to experience it. That's when you kind of kick yourself. And that quote that I use on the first one, the bitterness of, uh, or the sweetness of a low price is only matched with the bitterness of the remorse after you get it. That's a, I love that quote. I think it's so true with cameras. It's, it's, you sit there and you're like, I got such a good deal. I only paid 400 bucks and I got this camera and four lenses and then you try using them and you're like why did all my photos look like trash and it's like well it's because yeah you took a snapshot of everything and you, you really didn't get to get the proper tool that you needed for what to get the job done so yeah it is one of those things but the f 1.4 definitely for that guy i would say that the um the color on there is good. ISO is probably kept at 100 to 50 again. Nothing too crazy there. Shutter is going to be fast. One in one thousandths, um, just based on the grass in the foreground being focused and the dog being focused. So for this one, I probably would go either boat of using manual or I would do shutter speed priority depending on how involved I wanted to get with this. And then we got another guy diving into the end zone. I, so with this one, I've got a bunch of different things with this one. I don't think that the shutter speed was very fast. Football players move quick, but they don't move that quick. Mm -hmm. So I think that this would have been done at like maybe a 800 or close to a thousand, but not necessarily. I'd say anywhere between 500 and 800 is where I would peg this at, at a 1800 or 1500. From there, looking at him, he's in full, full detail. The turf underneath him has some good focus, but some blurriness to it, and especially where his hand is smacking. We can see it. The guys in the background, you can clearly make it out. You can even tell that that's a six on that guy's jersey who's standing up. So I really don't think that the f-stop is high. I think it's probably a 20 or maybe a 16 or an 18 just because they are a little blurry in the background. Um, and then on top of that too, I don't think that the shutter speed is definitely going to be that fast, but it still gets him in a good one. The graininess though, if you look closely at the jersey at his arm, you can see that there's an okay amount of grain. I don't think that this is at all the way up to like a 3200 like the Chrysler building photo was, but I think this is done at more of an 800 ISO, which gives it more of a film look. Um, to me, this looks like a 90s Kodak picture, but in reality, I know that this photo was taken in 2019 or 2020 based on his helmet. So um, I think it's a fun, again, fun thing that you can play with as a photographer when you're looking at all the different things you control within your exposure triangle. Another example, um, background looks pretty good, the bike's in full detail color looks a little bright and you can see some of the graininess in the wheel and how bright those lights are um, but overall this is probably going to be a higher f-stop probably a 32 or a 22 um, and then iso would probably be maybe a 300 400 iso because you got slight graininess especially in the sky where the buildings are um, and then good composition, again, kind of getting below the subject matter that we're taking. So going back into the beginner's class, very similar with what we were doing. And then learning your camera is only the start. Anyone can learn to use a camera. It's all about putting it into practice. So everything I teach you now, it's great information to have, but unless you physically go out there and just take pictures of even just a tree, you really won't put any of this into practice and really understand what I'm talking about. So. It doesn't matter what you take a picture of, just take a picture of something, practice all the stuff, understand it, even if you're just going to use auto the entire time. Because it might make or break, especially if you're on a vacation. Um, I get a lot of people that I sell a camera to them, they're like, I loved it, but I got frustrated after a day of shooting with it, so I put it away because I'm like, I didn't have time to fiddle with it during my vacation. It's like, well, there goes the whole reason you bought the camera, you know? So. Just learning how to do those things, even if you don't use them, is, is really important to understanding the whole, the, the, the grand picture of why you bought one of these and why you don't want to use your cell phone anymore. Um,
camera classes, practice, YouTube channels you love, workshops, travel, all different stuff that I would recommend. But really just get out there and shoot. So the main practice with all my exclamation points. Recommended accessories. I've talked about this a couple times. I know I've already mentioned it to you. You've got a bunch of stuff, so I won't go to too detail with it. But a bag, extra battery memory card, lens cleaning kit, strap tripod, external hard drive, polarizer filter, ND filters, additional lenses, all different stuff that you can get as a photographer that'll help you take better photos. Just add to your arsenal. Um, filters, I get a lot of people that ask what the filters. It really comes down to where you're taking photos in. If you're taking photos with a lot of glare, with a lot of light reflection, you might want to put a polarizer filter on there. It'll really mitigate what you get. Yeah, you know, they, they recommend that you do that. Yeah, they do. They do a lot. Especially with the mirrorless cameras. The mirrorless cameras pick up so much information. So you'll get that shine that's just beaten off of a car that's hitting you know your family on the light spot. And you just can't get away from it. No matter what angle you switch to, no matter where you hold the camera, that glare is always on them or whatever it is. So putting one of those on there shouldn't uh, mitigate the glare and it should help diffuse that. Um, a ND filter, so neutral density is kind of the same idea. Neutral density takes away the UV rays that come through. So let's say maybe you're not in an area that has intense glare. I use water or like snow as an example. If you go to a place and you're skiing, you get that awful reflection of light off the snow that like blinds you. Uh, same thing with water. If you're out on the water and you get that light that comes down, if it hits a wave a certain way, it's just you can't see anything. The UV filters and the polarizer filters help neutralize that and really kind of get through all of that light so you get a better image with less glare, less reflection. Date your body, marry your glass. Uh, I, this, this one always makes me laugh, but your body is going to, for the camera, is going to become outdated so quickly. Um, they just keep updating, and that's just the nature of cameras. Most times when you buy a camera body, you're looking at at least 10 years before you're going to see the technology become completely, almost outdated. Um, and that's nothing to do with what you bought. Um, that's more so based on just the fact that camera technology keeps getting better and better. So marry the glass that you get with the glass, invest the money in the lenses, invest the money in that because that's something that most of these brands carry over even if they get a new body out. So like for example, the Sony mount, Sony has had the same lens mount forever, the E mount. So in 10 years from now, they should still have it. So all the lenses you purchase for that camera, you can move to the next one. Same thing with yours. Uh, Nikon recently just changed theirs, but since 1952, they've been using the same lens mount, um, and they literally just introduced the Z mount. I got that. And like your experience, because I remember we talked about this camera, um, the camera that you have there has an adapter so that you right. can then put your older lenses yeah, I, on. I do have the adapter, yeah. also, so it works well. It's awesome. You know, I used stuff from the notes, and I heard the notes. I believe so. I think the Sony gets. I saw my note to the guy to sent the camera downtown. Yeah, yeah. He's ecstatic because he didn't have one in that condition. I know. Problem is, I put it away because I moved to an icon. But the thing is that it's the same. They use the same lens as in the note. Yeah. I, I have read that one, and I. Well, that was a, also it was still a film camera. I want to say that the Minolta was bought because I, Sony is. I mean, I, I don't. I don't believe Sony has ever done a film camera. Right. Not they, to my knowledge. No, they took Minolta. Yeah. I know that they, because when I went back to get a, a lens, I had to get a Sony. Yeah. But. Sony led the charge on mirrorless. Sony still continues to lead the charge on mirrorless. Yeah. Sorry to any Canon or Nikon people I got out there, but okay. Sony definitely has owned the market on that, and that's why now all these brands are making a mirrorless oh, yeah. camera yeah. Um, because it's just it's become the wave of the future, and it's going to continue that way. So, if I remember correctly, they did buy Minolta out, and then Sony has always been a big brand of consumer electronics, so they've always done the smaller stuff. TVs, radios was their big claim to fame in the early 40s. Um, and then cameras eventually took over and Sony cameras are, are pretty phenomenal but again it all comes down to the fact that um, with what I'm saying here the glass that you're getting for these lenses is 
some of the best glass that you can get anywhere in the world. And that's only because they put all of that, all this glass technology in there so that way you can get the focal length, you can get the sharpness, you've got motors that are reacting to when you do autofocus and non-autofocus. There's a lot of really cool stuff in there. So if you're gonna put money into a camera collection, this goes to anybody, I would say always put the money into the lenses and not so much the body, especially if you're just beginning, because over time you'll get a new body Eventually, when you buy your next body, you'll put the real money into that, but then you'll have a beautiful arsenal full of glass that is, you know, an f-stop of 1.4, or it's the trinity of lenses, which we'll talk about now, and it'll be a perfect um, segue into learning a new camera body with something you're already familiar with, too. So date your body, marry your glass. Uh, focal length and zoom is real quick, but um, focal length points to zoom uh, for the most part. Uh, basically, it's just changing the view frame of what you're at. So when you came in, you were talking about the lenses, you have a 16 to 50. So having something that's a lower number is gonna give you a wider angle. In this case, because we're shooting pictures of these um, uh, swans or these birds, I think they're swans, geese, uh, a gaggle of geese. Uh, because we're shooting this picture and they're so far away, we get a false sense of a wide angle. But then as we start changing and zooming in and the millimeter size gets higher or larger, that's where we're going to break the scene that we have or break the frame and start kind of sharpening in on the frame. So it just gets tighter and tighter. Um, and that's what I mean by focal length the quaints to zoom. Some people will say that they're two different things, but I say overall they're, they're basically the same thing. If someone asks you what's your focal length, they're asking really what your lens is going to be switching between, if it is a variable lens. It could also be a prime number, and a prime number just means that it's not going to move. It's going to stay at whatever number is written on the lens. And then a little GIF or GIF um, of what it looks like. If you're taking a portrait of somebody, it's important to remember that the higher the number is, the more kind of rotund they almost look. With focal length, there also comes compression and there comes uh, distortion with the photos. The smaller the number, the wider the photo becomes, but also the more distorted your subject matters can become in there. Again, very minimal in certain cases, but when we look at this guy's face when it gets to the 16, it almost looks like he has a pinhead. And then when we get up to the 130 or 200, he has a very square face. Um, 100 to, I would say between 50 and 100 is your sweet spot. Um, that 50 is a great portrait lens, 100 prime is one of my favorite portrait lenses, um, 70 is a good number to hit at too, I get a lot of people that like that one. I personally shoot on a 35, that's what makes me the most happy. A 35 in my opinion is a great street walking photography camera lens to have because you can do nice wide shots of buildings, but then if I walk into a subject close enough, I can get a nice perfect portrait of them too. Um, so I like a 35 millimeter lens on my camera at all times. Um, but remembering focal length and compression and just keeping that in mind so that way when you take a photo of something you don't sit there and say, well, I don't understand why this person looks like they're a stick figure. It might just be because of the compression based on the lens and how you have or how, what lens you have. What lenses do you need? So I was talking earlier about the different uh, exposure stuff and then we talked about how to work with that. Now let's talk about the three or what lenses. I'm going to say it's the three, the Trinity. So the kit lenses, what we've been talking about since you guys came in. Kit lenses are typically going to be a variable lens that gives you um, a, a small millimeter size to a higher millimeter size. In this case, we're looking at a Nikon DX lens, a very typical lens that you'll see with any of their DSLR bodies, 18 to 55. I was going to say, that's what you got. That's what everybody gets with one of theirs. They usually get this and then they get one that gives you a higher number too, which you also got with Sony. Um, the f-stop is going to be a 3.5 to 5.6. So what we were talking about um, in class here, and what I didn't say on, on the video, with the f-stops, when you see a number that says 3.5 to 5.6, what that means is that it's a starting number of 3.5 at the, at the 18 millimeter stop. As you start moving, that 18 to get closer to 55 and you're zooming in on your lens, changing your focal length, you are raising the lowest f-stop that it can be. So it no longer, the glass no longer can stay at 
when you start zooming in to that 55, it's going to start raising the number up to 5.6. When you get to the 55 millimeters on the lens and you're at the most open your f-stop can be, the, uh, the most open it can be at is 5.6. So it's important when you're picking lenses, and that's where we go back into the marrying your glass. If you're someone who wants to invest money, invest it in the glass and get something with the lowest f-stop possible so you have the most variation or most um, kind of openness as a photographer. But this is what a typical kit lens will look like. Sometimes you'll see 55 to 200 millimeters from there, and you'll see some other variations too. Sometimes it'll just be a prime lens, but it'll usually have a higher f-stop number than a nicer lens that you'd purchase separate from the camera. The nifty 50. So I say that 100 millimeters is the like sweet spot, but for the most part, 50 would be one of the best lenses you can get for the camera if you're trying to take a photo with the least amount of distortion. A nifty 50 or just a 50 millimeter lens is a great way to take a photo of you know just your dog, your family, the group, um, maybe you are selling something on Facebook Marketplace and you need a photo. This might be the better camera or better lens to use because you'll really get a clean image without any distortion and without having to worry about really too many variables. So nifty 50. A prime versus zoom lens. So we talk about a kit lens. We talk about the nifty 50. Now, breaking down what a prime versus zoom lens is. So a great example of a prime is going to be this 50 millimeter lens. A prime lens basically means that it stays in one constant um, millimeter size and can't vary from there. And rather, it has a dial on the end for your focus meter or your focus ring. Then it also has your f-stop ring, which is on the back there. We can see there's an area for auto where the camera will decide what the best f-stop should be for us. But then we can go as a photographer on that lens and change it all. So we see 16, we see the 11, we see the 8, we see the 5.6, and so on and so forth. That's what a prime lens would be. If we're doing a zoom lens, which we can see on the bottom left corner of our trinity, which I'll talk again, zoom lens is going to usually be anywhere from, you know, a, a good zoom lens can be a small number. It can be a 16 to 50. So you have a zoom lens, you have a zoom lens. All that means is it's going from a low number to a high number. You can also have an telephoto zoom lens, something like a 70 to 200, or a 200 to 400, or even an 800 millimeter um, prime. You can have various different amounts of zoom and um, of zoom lenses, and they can be any different types of sizes. So that's the difference between having a prime that stays at one number and a zoom lens which can differ between the two different numbers or the different numbers on the physical lens, the millimeter size. The Trinity though is going to be a combination of all of them. It's going to be the kit, it's going to be the nifty 50, and it's going to be your auto or your telephoto. Your telephoto will be your higher numbers. So for a lot of kit lens or, or a lot of kit people when they first get their camera, They'll get a 16 to 50, an 18 to 50, a 24 to 70, and then from there they'll also get a 70 to 200, or a 55 to 200, or maybe a 70 to 100. I, I usually don't see that low of a number, but it, it's something around there. And the idea is that you're getting to, to get to hit basically all the main points on a camera that you need to. You've got your medium telephoto for wide angle and portrait. And then you've got your telephoto, your extended telephoto, to see the birds in the distance or to see the cows grazing the field or to really get that far boat that's in the water. Um, those are what your zoom lenses are going to be. Your nifty 50 is going to be the lens that you take out when the family is at dinner and you don't need to zoom, you don't need to see anything special, you want the cleanest picture of your kids uh, enjoying their meal. That's when you would want to pull out the nifty 50. Uh, but the trinity of lenses... I think this is the standard. Most people get three to start when they're really trying to become a professional to amateur-based photographer. Um, for people that are just trying to get good photos and take better photos and they don't really care too much, I think that a 16 to 50 or an 18 to 50 or 18 to 70, 24 to 70, that's a great way to, that's a perfect one to be at. Um, just for what you get to see, what you get to take a photo of, and what you're able to hit. If you really want to get fancy with it, or you're a bird or nature photography guy, that's where I would say get a telephoto zoom and get the bigger one. 
And then a travel lens. So a travel lens is typically a lens that we call an all-in-one lens or something that does all of the numbers that we talked about. Typically the f-stop is something pretty ridiculous. So if we look at this one, it's a 3.5 to 5.6. So you, th you would think that this is a kit lens. But when you look at the numbers for this lens, this lens hits 18 at a wide angle all the way to 135. So you almost get a zoom lens, in, you get basically an all-in-one lens. You get a wide angle, you get the portrait, and you get something that can give you a little extra distance when you're trying to get that mountain or boat shot in the distance. Um, so the travel lens is another one that's really nice to have and to use. Um, typically you're going to see a pretty high f-stop with these guys. You can usually find a really nice one with a lower f-stop on there, um, but those are probably lenses that are somewhere between two and 3,000 in some of the cases. With these ones, you should be able to find a good higher number f-stop for anywhere between, I've seen them 300 at the cheapest, and I've seen them to about 7,800 at some of the more, a little more expensive ones. Um, but good glass, a good way to carry one lens with you when you're on vacation as opposed to uh, three or four different lenses. But that is all that I have for this class. And I know I'm supposed to end at 6.30 to ask for questions. Um, but thank you for paying attention through all this stuff. I put my information on the, on the page here. A lot of people have been asking about it. If you've got any questions, you can email me. My full name is Saxon, uh, last name Katowski. I'm at app.com for my email. Or that's my direct line. You can reach me here in the store at any time. Um, no, you're good. So if anything comes up, please ask. But I'm going to open the floor up now to questions. I see John, you said hello a couple times on here. Uh, if you have a question, please, by all means, ask. But uh, thank you for paying attention. And yeah, anything, please chat now. I'll keep this open for a little bit longer. Thanks. For you guys. We're good too. What questions do you have? All right, any questions? Quick, sorry, this is a 16 to 50. I don't need the nifty 50 right there. Yeah, 50. No, you got a 50. Huh? So it's your call on this one because you've got the kit lenses. So your numbers are a little higher on this guy. Your f stop is 3.5 to 5.5. Really, if you're just taking photos of the family and yeah, yeah, leisure, I think this is a great for you. If you, let's say, notice that maybe you don't need the 16 to 50 and you just want a lens that has more detail to it, then I would say maybe get the 50-50, keep these lenses at home, and then you can just travel with a little bit of a meteor lens. It'll probably be like that big, but it'll take much more detailed pictures in this one. But it just won't be the same. About the filter, is there a filter that you recommend? Uh, so I, use, I use a UV filter personally, or I like the, um, there's one that I know we have downstairs called Neutral Density, which actually rotates between polarized and UV. Um, but I would say anything that you can find, there's your, your size for your lens, so you can see that there's kind of the, the grooves on there that you can screw something on. That's where you're going to put the filter, and it's a 40.5 that you're looking for. So that's what that circle means on yeah, the I lens. Got, I got one. Actually, this is an old one. All yeah. my lenses are the same. Yeah. I've got the same camera every time. So I have an extra one. I just throw it on the screen. Okay. So yeah. it's a silver one. Take the one. Good. They give you a nice color with it, too. And then for the most part, once you put that on, just like his, you yeah. can usually put your lens cap cover back on. Right. Right. So it's nice. Right. 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 Now, are those interchangeable per brand? So I just need a 40.5? Yeah, you just need a 40.5. You can buy them anywhere, but maybe this seven here. Don't you we we do have them here. So I would check to see. I don't know exactly what sizes we still have in stock. Um, okay. I'd have to triple check, but I know if you'd ask me. You know, the Minolta used to come with a nifty 50. It used to come with a Yes, that's what they had. Yeah, in the beginning, that's what they had. But these guys come with all um, yeah, they variable, need more. Yeah, variable lens and things like that. But I have one. I traded it for this. But um, I, I, I saw what you were saying, you know, you can play with the f-stops there, and this, that's the problem I've been having. I'm like, man, I can't do what I used to do anymore. Yeah, yeah. And so maybe that's a good reason why I'm here, because um, now I'm going to go for my Nifty 50 again. Yeah. It's good to know, especially because for that, I'd say the most part is that people get these nice cameras, they put a lot of money into it, and they'll get that kit lens, and sometimes they'll be a great photographer, but they'll sit there and be like, why are my photos look like crap? Like, I don't understand yeah, they look, what happened. Yeah. And it's like, well, it's not necessarily you. You're doing all the right steps, but it's that lens that you have on there. Right. That lens isn't necessarily the most sharp or best quality. It's better to use auto with that, maybe, and then and do less of the manual or uh, aperture or shutter priority settings. But for the most part, I'd say both of these guys are powerful. They've got a good amount to it. I would say it's just playing with the ISO and the other stuff on there to see. 
and then you can kind of determine whether or not getting something that has a lower f-stop is appropriate. So like for you, I don't know necessarily if you need to get any other lenses other than maybe a prime lens, like a 50 millimeter. That might be perfect for you. But I think that two lenses that you can't got with this one, mixed with everything that this guy can do, should you should be great to start for a long time. What's your thoughts on um, just getting a, what do you call it, like an aftermarket lens? You know, like not by Nikon, not by Sony, I but someone else. I have zero right? issue with it. Um, I'm a, a huge fan. Huge, so there's a couple of people out there that make Tamron and Tamron, Sigma right, are like two big ones. One. Sigma, uh, one. Sigma is awesome. I'm a big fan. I like metal. I like heavy objects. I like just the feel of metal makes me feel like this is a quality item. Sigma makes all of their lens bodies out of metal, and I will love it. Now it's going to make your camera like three times heavier, so it kind of sucks if it's on your neck all day. Um, but I just love the feel of that. Tamron is going to be usually like 200, 300 bucks cheaper than everybody else, but they're using plastic on their lenses. So when you put them on, it's a great lens, great glass, great everything, but you'll feel that plasticness, and sometimes you squeeze the lens, you can feel like it bends a little bit. And so I get people who are like, they're all Team Tamron because they get a really good price on the lens. It's yeah. awesome, it shoots high quality, yeah. um, it just feels chintzy. And then I get people with the Sigma where they're like, you're paying, you're paying a lot just for metal, and then that thing's real heavy. But then that's longer too, would you pay the metal? Because plastic does kind of warp after. <laughs> I, I do and I don't. I just like metal because I think it's the materiality in, in my mind. I feel like it's going to last longer. I have customers that have come in with a 20-year-old uh, Tamron lens that is cracked up, broken in places, but it still takes a great photo. It still works. It's awesome. They've dropped it a hundred times. It still goes. Um, I've had people with a Sigma lens that have a giant dent in there, and it right. still works, too. Right. So, you know, I, I think overall it depends on how you are with your material, like how you are with your product. Um, I'd like to think that metal will last longer in the long run so it's been for myself. Um, I think Nikon uses a lot of plastic. Uh, Ni sure. Nikon uses polycarbonate. So like yeah, even this body, it's not a plastic body. If you feel it, it's got some tactile to it okay. and it's a, it has some weight to it. Polycarbonate, and actually yeah, if you touch it, it feels cold in certain areas. Cool. Um, it's not metal, it's not plastic. It's this hybrid material in the middle. And the reason the polycarbonate's really nice is let's say you're you're in Antarctica, you're taking photos of penguins. Mm -hmm. The body is able to swell and move with the cold. Okay. If you're in the Amazon and you're taking photos, same thing, it's able to swell and kind of fluctuate with the higher temperatures. Okay. So polycarbonate's become really popular for the camera bodies because of that. So metal is good and bad based on technology, based on products. Sometimes it doesn't let the product breathe and it doesn't let the inner components move around as much, and so it can actually damage your product. Plastic, on the other hand, can sometimes allow for it to move and swell, but then you don't have the same protection if you drop it. Like the metal will hold it nicer, the plastic might break a little bit easier. Polycarbonate, kind of the middle ground between the two, gives you some flexibility, but I don't have any downside for either of them. I would say my biggest thing is get what's in your price range. Get what's the best thing for you for what you're doing. Um, if that means that you gotta wait another month or two to, to save up for the extra four or five hundred bucks to get the trade yeah, to get yeah, what you need, yeah. I'm not gonna do it. Um, you'll you'll appreciate it more in the long run versus just being like, I got four hundred bucks, I need this kind of lens, what do you got? Yeah. Well, well, I'm gonna have to get that to fifty again though. That's what that's what I learned. <laughs> But this has been very good. good. I'm glad. This is probably the one that's a little more involved. I get more people who get something out of this one than last week. Last week's very basic. Yeah. Um, but I feel like this one, there's a lot to unpack during oh, yeah. it. So we'll be doing this class. So next Thursday we're off. I should probably mention that on this one. We're off next Thursday, everybody. We'll be back in two Thursdays. So the last Thursday of the month, which is going to be... pops up here. We'll be back Thursday, August 25th for the GoPro and action cameras. For you folks, uh, if you want to do another Thursday, next Thursday we're done, but if or we're not doing anything. So if you guys want to come in and ask me questions while I'm on the sales floor, by all means, bring your camera in for something specific you want to know. I can do it there. Um, action GoPro, if you want to learn how to use a GoPro, I can do that too, but you probably don't need that. Um, but then... Uh, September 1st and then September 8th. So September 1st will be the camera basics again, so what we talked about last week. 
but then September 8th will be this class again, the intermediate. So if it was fast and you want to know more about this again and you just want to get the information, come again, sit here, and I'll do basically the same presentation. If not, they'll all be on YouTube too on the app electronics page. So you can see. It's all there? Yeah, so it's all there. So that's why we do this way too. Because I get people that will comment and ask questions on there, but then it's nice because after this is done, done and it's done live streaming on there, you can also rewatch that video too. So if you go on there, you should see everything too. So if there's anything I didn't cover. So I this is going to happen. Go to YouTube and then just go to just look up Apple Electronics. Okay. And you'll see a bunch of videos about products and different stuff. Okay. Somewhere in there are the camera okay. class videos. Okay. I'm in there. I just don't know where. I haven't okay. looked them up. I don't want to see myself on the camera afterwards, so I haven't looked them up. But yeah. So hopefully very good. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. That's awesome, man. Anytime. 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 Refresher. Good. 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 Um, I used to be a member of a camera club downtown many years ago. Okay. And we used to have competition. And that's when I had my, my Nifty 50. Yeah. And I, I had a long way, but you know, we're good. We're going to race tracks, we do everything, but it's awesome. been a while, so I'm trying to get back into it. I've met a couple people that are doing some like different camera clubs. One is at the Botanic Gardens, they do this whole thing, and they, they get a kick out of it. She was showing me a couple photos. She did of a butterfly kind of taking the nectar out of a plant. Oh, wow. And she just had her, I, a very basic, like a rebel, it was a very basic camera, but she did some really awesome that's, photos. That's, that's all um, good. So there's definitely clubs out there too, so right. I definitely recommend if there's anything out there and you're interested in that. This club was for Dearborn. I don't, I'm not sure if they're around anymore. I don't, I don't, I've heard of that. Yes. I, mean, I know of the yeah, story for yeah, 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 it's yeah. amazing. That's amazing. Hey, thanks a lot. Anytime, guys. Anytime. Yeah. I'll see you next week. Okay. Thank great you very much. Thank you. Good luck with everything. If you need anything, give me a call. Shoot me an email. All right, everybody. It looks like that is it for today's class. Let me see if I had any other questions. Uh, John, there is no... Uh, I'm not Brian. Um... I don't know what Brian was saying on there, but I think he made a Family Guy reference joke. So either way, guys, thank you again for being on here. Have a great night, um, and get after it. Take some